Europe is now the epicenter of the coronavirus. This is the worst public health crisis for a generation. Stay at home unless you absolutely have to go out. Hello and welcome to this special edition of The Nexus. Now you may have noticed I'm not in the studio. That's because, like millions of others, I'm working from home. So in fact is most of the Nexus team. The idea is to minimize the risk of catching and spreading the coronavirus. Today, we're gonna to be looking at lockdowns around Europe and the United States and asking an epidemiologist which countries got it right. We'll also be hearing from a lawyer in New York who says with the lockdown, it's actually a good time to be a criminal. We'll then head over to Seattle where CEO Dan Price and all his employees have been working remotely for a month now. They don't call him the best boss in America for nothing. And if you're working from home, we have some advice on how to stop people bothering you. So a lot to get through. Let's begin with this quick look at the people in lockdown. Some breaking news out of Italy. All of Italy is now on lockdown. All of Italy is now on lockdown over the coronavirus. <laughs> People, please stay at home unless you absolutely have to go out. Tutti insieme ce la faremo. Di combattere, di combattere poi eh, stando, stando a casa. Europe is now the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic with cases across the continent. This is the worst public health crisis for a generation. Worst health crisis that France has known in a century. We are in a... Situation. The Spanish government looks set to follow in Italy's footsteps and impose a 15-day nationwide lockdown. No one will be allowed to leave their homes in an effort to stop uh, the spread of the virus. All schools, colleges and child capsules in Ireland will close. The virus is all over the world. It will continue to spread, but it can be slowed. I'm officially declaring a national emergency. What we have on our hands is a public health emergency. And let's get right to the latest headlines on coronavirus because there are a lot. I am ordering all bars and restaurants in the state of Illinois to close. We are calling for the home isolation of all seniors in the state of California. Breaking news, Mayor de Blasio announces he is shutting down New York City's school system. We are dealing with a challenge and a crisis that we have never seen in our lifetimes. All bars across the city of New York will be closed. All Broadway shows have been canceled up until April 12th. I haven't seen the streets that empty here in the city. I mean, I just can't remember. Wow, this place is like a ghost town. There's tons of rumors <laughs> around New York City that the city could be locked down. We do not have the capacity to manage this number of cases. That's what happened in Italy. Let's start building temporary hospital facilities before that happens, because it will happen. So even the city that never sleeps has succumbed to the coronavirus lockdown. Let's start in the United States, and we're going to start in New York, with Vinu Varghis, he owns a Wall Street law firm. Uh, some of his staff are at home. He said they could stay at home if they felt they were concerned. Uh, he's actually in his office. And on the other side of the United States, in Seattle, Washington, we have Dan Price, the man who is frequently known as America's best boss because he has paid his workers a minimum salary of $70,000 a year. And I don't think his reputation is being done any harm over this particular crisis because he and his employees have been working from home now for a month. Uh, Dan, Vinu, thank you both very much for joining us on The Nexus. Vinu, I would like to start with you. You're in New York. Uh, you're on Wall Street. Tell us, what is the city like now? It's uh, somewhat of a ghost town. I mean, normally at this time of, of day, there are thousands and thousands of people walking through here, through the Wall Street area. My office is on Wall Street, to Wall Street. It overlooks Broadway and Wall Street. I can see Hamilton's grave from my window in Trinity Church, and there is hardly anybody walking around. It is quite a scene. It reminds me of that Will Smith movie, uh, you know, when he was the last man on the planet. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's a strange situation. And, and you have allowed uh, some of your uh, employees to work from home today. What made you take that decision? Well, we started this uh, 
last week when uh, this was where everything was trending. Uh, you know, we've sent out a thing that you know people have the choice to work at home. Some of my employees are here. I have a couple in in house because they've chosen to come in. Uh, the other ones are, are multiple employees are working from home, and we do we're doing a Zoom video conference every morning, uh, uh, twice a day with everybody, and then uh, talking throughout the day as needed. When I get off the phone with you, I'm actually going to jump on Zoom again with one of my employees who's who's working from home. Um, if if someone feels sick, they don't want to come in, then don't come in. I mean that's just basically it. Uh, apparently, the law courts. Are, are well, they're not very busy, and there's also a problem with a uh, few police on the streets. What's going on? So the courts have basically, uh, state and federal courts have issued these things basically that they're suspending all non-essential uh, hearings. This is potentially going to create a civil liberties issue for those people that are incarcerated and you know looking for a a trial. I mean, all all. Defendants, criminal defendants in, in in the country have a right to a speedy trial. So that's constitutionally based provision. Um, this is going to put a strain on that. And one of the things that the police are doing right now is it's very clear that they were going to do this. I knew it was going to happen. They're going to start cutting back on the number of arrests. And basically the DA, uh, the district attorney here in New York yesterday said something to the effect of that anything that doesn't lead to violence, that basically they're going to cite and release and give future court dates. And what this means and is also from law enforcement's perspective, some of these guys are not, a lot of the law enforcement isn't going to be doing their regular work. So it's actually maybe the best time to be a criminal at this point. You're actually saying that criminals will get away with it because of the coronavirus, there's, they're, they're, because the police are being told not to make arrests, there's no point. The court systems aren't working properly. It's not that the police have been not told to make arrests. What's going to happen is that there's going to be a, a scale back, and there already is in ongoing investigation. So I might be saying it in a somewhat flippant manner, but I'm being serious. Look, I'm an attorney. Yeah. I, I represent people charged who are accused of, of of crimes, I am no at all, I'm not at all supporting lawlessness or anarchy in that point. The point is that there, the law enforcement is going to be constrained right now. So at this point, this, this, there is a time. There's going to be a lag before, obviously, maybe for months, before law enforcement gets back to its regular routine of investigating right. people. Let, let's uh, flip over to the other side of the United States now, to Dan Price. Uh, Dan, uh, you have a company, uh, Gravity Payments, you're the CEO and founder of that company, and your employees are working remotely, as are you. Uh, what made you take that decision? Well, we, um, we're looking at this as a health crisis and um, also an economic crisis. You know, our clients are small businesses that are dependent on all of us out there shopping. And so it's a really scary thing for them to see their sales some are down by 40, 50, 60 percent. Some are completely shut down, as you know, some of the restaurants and bars that are completely shut down. But all of us right now are managing the, the, the curve of this epidemic. And what that means is we need to limit our contact with each other. We need to stay six feet away from each other. We need to be really careful about sanitation and managing any services we touch, because if I just go out there and interact with everybody or if my employees do that, then we are going to overwhelm the public health system in a week or two weeks from now. And people that are in urgent need of critical care are not going to be able to get the care that they really need. So we're rationing contact with each other right now. And it's a horrible, difficult situation. But what's wonderful and exhilarating about it is that we're all in it together. And the sooner that we wake up to the crisis that we're in, the sooner that we can get back to life as normal or as normal as and it can be someday from now. And Dan, uh, some companies are going to be reluctant to let their employees work from home. They're, they're concerned it might reduce their productivity. What have you noticed? I would say Gravity, we have a very aut high autonomy culture where we trust our people, where they are very motivated. You know, they're fighting for the little galler guy every day. We're, we're sticking up for the people that are fighting for the American dream. And so that really pushes us, small and medium-sized business owners that are 
targeted by monopolies through big payment schemes and software. We're trying to help them compete. So that's really motivating all of us. And it gives us that extra edge where we can work from home for several months and continue that, to work together, me. continue to collaborate. I will tell you, while this is one of the most difficult challenges I've ever faced in my life, and that's not an exaggeration, I've never been more proud of the work and the effort that my team is putting in than I am right now with everybody working from home. Well, there's another company in your state, of course, and that is Amazon. We've seen the headlines that Amazon wants its employees, warehouse employees, to work overtime despite uh, advice about social distancing. And uh, we've heard that a lot of them are pretty unhappy about that. What's your take on that? Well, we have to take this very seriously, and I think Amazon needs to do a lot more on several levels. One, they need to stop avoiding taxes. They need to pay their taxes because I think this is proof that we are all in it together. And when you have one major big actor like Amazon or like Jeff Bezos basically saying they don't need to invest in the system, they can just take, 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 but never give back, you end up having these big crises without the infrastructure to deal with it. But yes, we absolutely need Amazon to take more precautions now, I understand that we do need basic necessities, that Amazon and other retailers are delivering some of those basic necessities, but they need to really take this crisis seriously and keep their workers really, further apart yeah. and make sure that they're not having a high chance of infecting one another or coming into close contact with one another, like all of us well, are. That's a, good, that's a good point, Dan, because, of course, uh, Amazon has seen demand surge for you know, parcels being delivered straight to home instead of people... Uh, going to the high street. I wanted to ask you uh, whether you've had to implement some special um, technology, laptops and so on, in order to help your, just briefly, in order to help your workers uh, to actually work remotely. You know, we um, we fortunately have uh, our chief operating officer, her name's Tammy Kroll, and she's probably one of the best incident crisis you know, managers and, and preparers in the world. And so she had us all prepared for some sort of a crisis like this, where we would have problems. And that's gotten us way ahead of the curve. We've had to replace some phone systems and laptops here and there, but for the most part, we were prepared knowing that something like this could happen. And that's allowed us to continue to be productive, continue to support our small and medium-sized business clients. But we have a lot more work to do ahead of us because we're still potentially in the early days of this crisis. And that crisis is spilling over into all these small businesses that are missing their revenue. We need to find creative solutions to keep them in business because well, our economy depends on it. I wanted to ask you if you think this is going to be the moment when the entire world starts to look at the, the actual model of working and whether or not this is gonna to lead to a sort of a, a complete step change, if you like, a sea change in working? Well, I really hope so, because up until this point, for my whole lifetime, work has been focused about making money and consolidating as much wealth and power to as few hands as possible. And I think what this crisis is teaching us is that we're all in it together. And if we are doing that proactively, we're actually going to be hurting everybody. So we need to shift from a model of trying to get Wall Street trying to get shareholders, trying to get billionaires and CEOs to become more rich. And we need to shift to a model where everybody has their needs taken care of and can also contribute to society. And that's a really hard shift that needs to happen. But I think this crisis will pale in comparison to the many crises we will face. And the, the, the sooner we make that shift, the more that we will avoid all of that problem for all of us as humans, not just for people that don't have enough, but it'll spill over into the entire economy. Dan, just one last question before you go, uh, not directly related to the coronavirus, but you're often known as America's best boss because you pay your employees a minimum wage of $70,000 a year. In order to do that, you had to take a pay cut and make other sacrifices. I'm just wondering uh, why you did that and if it's actually paid off for you. Yeah, well, you know, taking a million dollar pay cut and uh, and potentially decreasing the profits of my company from a couple million bucks down to zero was was felt like a big risk. And I had to mortgage my house and do a lot of things to kind of make it work. But it's worked out so uh, worked out so well. Uh, it's paid off so well because we're providing a certain level of basic needs for everybody where rather than trying to enrich the people at the top, 
we've brought our top of our pay scale down from 1.1 million down to 275,000. And so we just have a multiple of like three or four uh, for people that work at Gravity, which is plenty for people to progress, to be able to be a little bit on the wealthier, more affluent side. But the scale having the bottom elevated allows everybody to have their needs met. And that's taken away distractions that's increased our capability, increased our productivity as a company. And as a result, we're triple the size now, just five years later. But not only that, it's really benefited the people that work at Gravity. We went from zero to two babies born per year to we've had almost 50 announced in five years, 15 just last year. People doubled or almost tripled their savings rate. And 70% of the company reported that they were able to uh, pay down their debts. So those are some really wonderful things that just allow all of us to hopefully weather these types of storms because people are so yeah. much better prepared in terms of their personal financial health. Dan Price and Vinay Varghese in New York, thank you so much for your contributions to the Nexus. We really appreciate that update from the United States. We are going to turn to continental Europe now, Italy, France, Spain, where the lockdowns have been even more severe. Il governo sta facendo il massimo, siamo in guerra, questo è un nemico invisibile e sicuramente le nostre generazioni non sono preparate a questo tipo di situazione. È no, lamentabile perché questa è una città fondamentalmente che, che dipende de, del turismo, del turismo e questo affetta tutti i lo, 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 lo negozi, i lo, lo bar e i ristoranti, le la, tiende. O sea, penso che va a affettare economicamente Muchas, muchas, eh, eh, muchos negocios, muchas cosas. A partir de aujourd'hui, je suis confinée chez moi à travailler. Normal, voilà. Après les attestations, bah, ce sera pour aller chercher euh, à manger, s'il en reste. Mais euh, rien de plus, il n'y a pas de besoin autre que, que de sortir pour aller s'approvisionner se, 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 en nourriture. Meanwhile, here in the United Kingdom, the government has avoided such a severe lockdown, at least so far merely advising people not to attend mass gatherings. And millions of people are still going to work pretty much as normal, even shopping. Here's Sarah Morris. Well, this is Oxford Street in central London. It's usually one of the busiest shopping and tourism precincts in the country. And there is definitely far fewer people on the street today. Although, as you can see, it's certainly not empty. Now, that's because we're in a sort of voluntary lockdown or a social curfew, if you like. We've been advised to try and work from home. We've been advised to avoid the pub and the club, the theatres, cafes, restaurants. Also been told not to gather socially in big groups or small groups. But we haven't been told or ordered not to do any of these things. As such, some people are still venturing out. I've got things to do. I can't stop my whole life because we need to be inside, not touching anything. I'm not like high risk and I don't live with anyone that's high risk. So if I have a couple of things to do, then I'll do it. With less footfall on the streets, some of the shops have decided already to close down and this is probably just the start of the economic strain that this outbreak is going to cause. So why is the United Kingdom handling this crisis so differently to some parts of the United States and Italy, Spain and France? Let's find out with Dr. Shemaz Ladani now. He is a senior epidemiologist in London. Uh, Dr. Ladani, thank you for joining us on the programme. There's far more freedom uh, to move around. The schools are open, for example, in the United Kingdom. What accounts for the different approach? So the UK has taken a more scientific approach to try and control the uh, COVID outbreak. The reason is that if you go into a complete lockdown, essentially you are not being exposed to the virus. So once the lock lockdown is released, it's very difficult to know how the population will behave and the chances are that the virus will come back into the population so you would need to have multiple lockdowns to control this outbreak the modeling work that is being done in the uk suggests that if you allow cases to occur over the summer months then what could happen is that you would reduce the peak of disease next winter by almost two-thirds and prevent almost half the deaths because you are not overusing the healthcare system. A number of experts, especially in Italy, Spain and France, have said that's the wrong approach. You should keep people indoors until a vaccine or better treatment is established because otherwise you're going to find more people are at risk and more people will die. 
So a vaccine and a treatment are more than a year away. And with vaccines, there's no guarantee that the vaccines that are being developed will work straight away. There have to be rigorous testing, especially for safety and effectiveness before you can recommend it to millions of people. So that is quite a while away. And it's not realistic to have a lockdown until then. The UK strategy is not that much different to the other countries. What the UK is allowing to do is that they're allowing schools and universities to continue and they're allowing healthy adults to go out and work as normal with some restrictions to the elderly and those who have underlying medical problems. The idea is that virtually all children uh, recover from this infection without any problem and uh, they hardly ever get serious illness from coronavirus. And older adults are the ones who are at greatest risk, and they are being asked to stay at home and self-isolate. So the idea is that if you can actually get the infection passing through children and healthy adults, there will come a point where they will become immune to the infection, and then they will not transmit it to those who are at risk. Sure, but you, you, say, you say they're taking a more scientific approach than other countries, but we are talking about, for example, in the United States, New York, Los Angeles closing schools. You're not telling me, surely, that they have a less scientific approach, do you? There are different models that looking at it. We are in unprecedented times. There is no right or wrong. Everybody is learning by trying different strategies, and we still don't have enough information to be able to make a right call. So every country is trying to do the best that they can, uh, and then it will take a little time before we find out. So, for example, the complete lockdown in China and in South Korea, we are now reached a point where they have controlled the infection. So it will be interesting to see how that develops over the next few weeks. And that will help others uh, decide how best to manage the outbreak. You have to remember that this is an ongoing process. It's not something that is decided once and for all. So every day the UK is making decisions based on the information that they get yeah. on that particular day. I, I, want to, so, I want to ask about the information they're getting because a lot of people have complained there's not nearly enough testing being done in the United Kingdom. There is an obsession about testing, which is very difficult to understand. Testing is very expensive, it's very laborious, and it takes two or three days for the results to come through. It doesn't really add to the problem. The vast majority of people right now who are symptomatic are most likely to have coronavirus because we're in a season where there's very little else going on in the background. Simply having a test to measure it doesn't really help you. What we do is we have a multi-pronged surveillance uh, strategy looking at primary care attendants, uh, hospital attendances, intensive care admissions and deaths. And we're focusing on the more severe end of the spectrum where we can make a difference by controlling how many people get hospitalized and how many require intensive care. And that is the right way to use the limited resources which every country will suffer from. Just a final question for you, Dr. Ladani. Uh, there was a survey done uh, by another network. They spoke to a lot of people in the NHS, the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. Most of the respondents, overwhelmingly, the healthcare workers said the NHS is not prepared by any means for the increase in uh, hospital admissions that's likely to happen over the next few months. Do you share that estimation? I think that you will find that every country that's going to be hit by coronavirus will have exactly the same problem. The, there are very, There is no country that has the capacity to deal with it. We saw what happened in Wuhan, China. They had to build hospitals. They had to identify different places where they had to provide medical care. No country is able to cope with the number of infections that are going to come through. So the idea is to actually spread the infection over time and the right way to do is to balance the number of serious illnesses with the capacity of the healthcare system. And that is a very, very tight balance to, ha to hold. But those countries that get that balance right are the ones that are going to do really well. The UK has decided that by having more cases in the summer months, it will reduce the peak in the winter months when the next coronavirus outbreak is likely to occur. Uh, because simply that's the way uh, the coronaviruses usually work. Other countries will have different strategies, but I assure you that every country will struggle to cope because no country has sufficient healthcare capacity for an outbreak like this. Dr. Ladani, thank you very much for your contributions to the Nexus. We've come towards the end of the show now. A lot of people aren't interested in that kind of advice. They want to work from home to protect themselves and their loved ones. 
And if you are one of those millions of people who are working from home, you're going to need some advice on how to do it successfully. We've been speaking to Liam Martin. He helps businesses to work out how they can organize their workforce into remote teams. He said there's been a surge in demand for his services. And here's his top tip for working at home. Generally, what you need to be able to do is make sure that you have a very committed workspace versus social space. So if you have your own office, like I do right now, uh, I'm currently in my office. I have this big external monitor that I usually connect to as well. That's great. But if you don't have something like that, even focusing on a, a small desk that you might have or a spot on your couch where you only do work and tell everyone that you're living with that, hey, I'm in work mode right now. I'm not in social mode because a lot of people don't really understand that just because I'm in this physical space doesn't mean that I'm currently available to be able to work with you and solve family problems, as an example, or social problems. You need to be able to make that very clear divide, and that's going to be really great for your mental health. Well, that is it for this special edition of The Nexus. Thank you for watching. We will be following this crisis in the weeks and months ahead. Until next week, though, goodbye.